Yeah, that was a lot. That was more than one question. <laughs> um, but we actually had a conversation about that scene recently when we were shooting. Um, and it was, I'll tell you how, what, what precipitated the conversation. So, Jake Abel has been back on the show. And he's had a... He's had a has it? That hasn't aired, right? Yeah. Well, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> so, Jake um, has been back on the show, and he's had, I'm not going to tell you the exact details of what he's doing, um, but I want to. <laughs> but he's had a really challenging, uh, he's had a really challenging role on the show, like, from an actor's standpoint. Like, the stuff that he's had to do is like, ah, I, I would see that and I would be like, ah. Oh. Oh, I think I have a, I think I have a sore throat today. I think we're gonna work. <laughs> um, so it, it, it really sounds really tough, and he has been really deliberate. And one of the things that you, that we have noticed uh, as the regular cast on the show with Jake is that um, we'll do a second take. A lot of times, guest stars on the show are nervous and they've been practicing a lot, and they come in and. And the director will ask for a change, and they won't really be able to change because they're they're just like they figured out one way to say it, and they're nervous, and they're just sort of stuck in that line reading. But without getting without being prompted by the director, Jake is always giving a really different performance on each take and doing a really great job. And um, and me, Jared, and Jensen were in the scene with him, and we were like, oh, hi. <coughs> Like, you can't just come in here and do, like, an actual do acting. This is making us look awesome. really bad. So we had to start talking to, with him, and we straightened him out. We're like, look dude, if you want to work on the show, you can't be like this. God starts phoning it in, like us. Um, <clears throat> but, after, We've been, you know, we've been shooting Supernatural for 34 years, and, <laughs> and after a while, um, it's easy to just sort of, it's easy to get a little bit lazy, and every once in a while we're like, you know, we're, we, we know our characters well, we can go through the motions well, um, and it doesn't take, like, we, don't, we can show up at work and not have done a ton of preparation, and still, you know, people won't, fans, so keep watching the shit, so what you think? Maybe you start to give me off after that, then we can get away with anything. Uh, but uh, Jensen and I had a conversation, and it was a little bit precipitated by well, how, uh, how, what a spell like uh, Jake was doing. Um, and uh, the conversation was like, yeah, you know, it reminded us, uh, we were reflecting on that scene that we did at the end of that episode where both of us felt like, you know, like we actually got, you know, really kind of emotionally engaged in the scene and it felt like we were really connected and not, you know, I mean, a lot of times we connect when we're shooting, but it's like, because somebody's tickling someone's balls below frame <laughs> and trying to make them laugh, you know, that's the way we connect. <laughs> so, um, so to actually have a moment, you know, have a moment where it really felt like, oh, yeah, that's like it was a nice reminder of, of um, you know, how how connected the characters are, and how how connected we are deep down to the characters, um, and, and it felt good. And in, and that, in spite of the fact that you know when we went into that scene feeling like, does this, you know, does, does you know, where where is all this emotion coming from? Can we justify it? And somehow it felt like, yeah, we, we figured it out and, and it worked it worked for us in a way. Um, but, you know, I could sit up here and compliment myself for hours, so I'll move on to the question. Thank you. Hi. 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 but we're still pretty early in. So what would you like to see happen between Cass and other characters this season? Um, 
Uh, I guess I, I think it would be nice. Um, I mean, you know how we had a lot of biblical lore on the show. Um, I think it would be nice if cast were to have the opportunity to get to know more of the characters on the show in the biblical sense. <laughs> You know, I mean, I think that that question that for, for Cassiel of like, the, the, the gentleman earlier asked about like, feeling like he belongs and he's part of the family, um, I think that sort of exploring that question, you know, Cass and Dean are um, at loggerheads, to say the least, at the, at the outset of the season. Um, and, and that is not quickly resolved. Um, so what you saw last two weeks ago um, at the end of the episode, um, that that's you know still is waiting for some time, and um, and I think a resolution of that conflict, but also like you know the Winchesters for Cass are his connection to humanity, and not just that, it's his only real connection to any beings in the world anymore. He's without the Winchesters. He has nothing. And by the way, without the Winchesters, the Winchesters have nothing. Like, this little unit is pretty self-contained. It's not like there's a broad social network of support. It's not like when they have problems, they have a lot of shoulders to cry on. It's a pretty tight-knit group um, who really depend on one another and who aren't good at talking about their feelings. So it's a recipe for emotional disaster. And, um, and I and I think that, that that story is something that I'd like to see um, resolved in some way for Cass, and I'd like to see him feel like he belongs. Um, but um, you know, I don't I don't know how happy of an ending uh, this show has in store for Cass or the brothers. Um, but I do. I do think, you know, from the conversations I've had with writers on the show, I think that the, the conclusion will have a finality to it. It won't feel like it's a continued story. Um, and um, if at least one of you doesn't cry, uh, I'll be disappointed. All right, thank you. Thank you. Topic of it with poetry. Sorry. Hey. Yeah, we, we try to stick to the topic here. <laughs> it's just one of the rules of creation shows. I'm sorry. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> um, so, you know, lately I've been thinking about this idea of like the Bible being a story of hope. Um, and I've been thinking influenced you in wanting to write poetry, and which ones do you absolutely abhor? Um, I actually just read an article this morning in Vice um, about a woman who um, created an Instagram poetry account that garnered quite a few followers. Um, and her, she, she was doing a, an experiment to see if she could write total garbage and have people like it. And she was really shocked and disappointed to find uh, the results were, um, yes, she could get people to like it, and yes, it was total garbage. Um, so there's an interesting phenomenon right now. I'm not going to name names, but uh, I'll say that the, there is an interesting phenomenon in poetry right now. Um, which is, uh, by the way, I'll just say two, two poets that the two poets that I think influenced me the most are Will Bill Gay and um, and Mary Oliver. Um, but there are maybe I also like some of the older Susie poets. By older I mean like many hundreds of years ago, like Rumi. Um, but um, but that's that's the short answer. And then the longer answer is that right now there's a resurgence of poetry because of Instagram, which is really counterintuitive and totally bizarre. And on balance, I think it's a good thing because I think it's causing, it's causing a lot of younger people to discover that poetry even exists and 
and that further written words exist. Um, and so I think that that's a good thing. Um, but I think that the, the form has been a little bit co-opted by some really trite garbage. Um, so there are a lot of Instagram poets who have, there's some that are like kind of famous who have actually been plagiarizing other poets. There are some that are writing these, you know, uplifting, pithy little poems that are just empty. They're not poems, they're just phrases. Um, so I cringe at some of that, but I'm also happy that some of these, I mean, some of these books that are being now published in print by Instagram poets are reaching bestseller lists. So for poetry, it's not written by a superstar, a poet laureate poet to be getting on the bestseller list is, a, is in, in some respects a good thing, but it's also, also bad. So it's, uh, it's a complicated issue as far as I'm concerned. And I write poems, and I, um, and I wonder, am I writing garbage too? Should I, should I press delete all um, and and reset the hard drive to make sure these don't get out of the world? Um, but I spent too much time writing them to do that, so I'm gonna send them out there, and I don't care if they're terrible. More of a president thing. Um, I don't know if you remember the awkward exchange between Melania and um, Michelle Obama. Oh. The whole Tiffany blue box gift. Oh, yeah. uh, what gift did you give the outgoing president? <laughs> Coming to office. Uh, the outgoing president, I would give Tim with handcuffs. <laughs> What was your immediate question? Well, uh, what, like next time, what, what place did you see in India? What place did you see in India? No, like, what did you see next on your next trip? I'm not you have to go again, so. Okay, I do? <laughs> Good. Um, go every two years with me. <laughs> I, I, do you go every two years? I do, but I will. Where do you live? Or where uh, are you from? Or where Billy, do you go? Billy, Billy and Pink down there. Okay, very cool. I've never been there. Uh, so that's where I would go. Uh, uh, we went to India, in, Vicky and I went to India in 1995, and um, we had like a really adventurous trip. She had been there when she was 16, shortly after we met. Um, she went and worked in a Sofash uh, orphanage in Pune and raised a bunch of money, and then they were like, hey, we have this baby uh, that somebody back in the States wants to adopt. Can you bring it back for us? Oh. This is how the world was when we were 16. And she was like, sure, I'll take the baby. <laughs> and they gave her uh, a little box of formula and a package of diapers and sent her with an infant uh, flying back to, the, to DC um, from what was Bombay at the time. And uh, and then flights were canceled. Oh. She was stuck there. It took her like four days to get back. She was 16 years old, and she had this infant with no instructions. She had no idea what to do with it, and it was like crying constantly, and it was sick, and she didn't know what to do. And she got back determined to never have children. <laughs> um, but we, yeah, we had a we had a great adventure when we were in India. One of the things I don't know if you guys have seen the documentary on Netflix, Wild Wild Country. Um, it's yes. fascinating, and it's about the Bob Brown Sri Rashidi's uh, cult, and it was in uh, Oregon at the time. And they were kicked out of Oregon for all sorts of nefarious things, including murder and whatever, and <laughs> poisoning an entire town, stuff like that. Everyone in Oregon was like, oh, you know, let's do that here. So they made them leave. <laughs> And the cult leader um, had, at, at one point, when I think he ended up having like 50 um, Rolls Royces, he had fleet Rolls Royces. And so we decided we would infiltrate the cult, which had been transplanted to Luna, India. And so we went through the initiation process and we had this plan to smuggle in the camera. Uh, we had this high eight camera and we would smuggle it in and document what really happens inside this cult. Um, 
but then we were going to do it with two of our Indian friends, and they wouldn't let local Indians into the group at the time. And Vicky and I got, we lost our shit. Like, That's racist, you get in there. And then they didn't let us in the call. <laughs> So oh, that was a sort of failed uh, endeavor. Um, but anyway, I have more stories, but I'm not going to share them. <laughs>